So Dustin, the this is yours. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very pleased to be talking here at this Tobos conference. Um, I uh, well, I don't know. Like many people, my first time meeting Topos was uh, when I was studying a telco homology as a student. And like many people, I was given the advice that you shouldn't delve into the general theory because the, all you need to know is just looking at the example of a tall sites and doing things explicitly there. And like, thankfully enough people, I ignored that advice and studied the general theory anyway. So, and this has been good for me. So I'm very happy to be here talking about this in a setting where I don't feel like I have to shy away from the general nonsense. Um, <laughs> so, Yes, so this is in some sense part one of two talk. Uh, with, uh, we've got um, my collaborator, Peter Schulze here. We're gonna be uh, explaining some aspects of the work we've been doing over the past few years. Um, let me start by sharing my screen. Let's see if it works. Okay, so there's the title. Um, and let me draw just a rough schematic of the situation I wanna sketch out here. Um, so we've got the, well, the concept of topos, I guess. Um, and then there's another very interesting, very general uh, class of categories. We think of a topos as a kind of category. Um, class of categories called the categories generated by compact projectives or the uh, sifted in categories. So I'll just write S in for categories generated by compact projectives. I'll, part of my goal is to explain a little more about what that means. And then there's some intersection here with things which are both a topos and are generated by compact projectives have very favorable properties. And specific examples are given by pre-sheaf toposes. And then there's one example, well, there are lots of examples, of course, outside that, but there's one example in particular I wanna talk about, which is the example of uh, condensed sets. So that's a rough schematic of uh, the world we're gonna be talking about here. Um, and I'll take it for granted that, well, the concept of topos is at least somewhat familiar to everybody who's attending this, um, this conference, but I wanna spend a little bit of time uh, reminding the definitions over in this half here and what, how they came up and what, what they do for you. Um, so, so here's a, the basic definition. So suppose C is a category um, with all co-limits. And let uh, X be an object in C. So the first part is we say um, X is compact um, if, and this is the standard definition, if Holmes out of X um, commutes with filtered colons. Um, the second is uh, we say X is projective Uh, if palms out of X commutes with a different class of co-limits, um, namely um, reflexive co-equalizers. Um, so let me, well, what does that mean? So a co-equalizer is when you take a, well, when you co-equalize two maps and it's a reflexive co-equalizer if there's a common uh, a common retraction for these, or common, what do they call it, a splitting? Or it's a splitting, yeah, a common splitting for these two maps. Um, so that seems, it might seem a little bit weird um, at first sight, but there's a method to the madness. Um, so, well, so then X is compact and projective, or, or compact projective. Um, so, well, compact projective, if and only if it's compact, and projective, but then you can also characterize it in terms of um, homing out commuting with certain co-limits. Um, well, it's whatever co-limits you can build by combining filtered co-limits with reflexive co-equalizers, but there's a, a nice characterization of such co-limits. Um, uh, this should commute with sifted co-limits. Where, um, a diagram is said to be sifted if, well, you know, if whenever you have two objects, then the category of common objects they map to is connected. Uh, 
So it's a weakening of the notion of a filtered co-limit where you require sort of asymptotic equality of all you know, morphisms originating from any two. Um, uh, and maybe I should have a, a condition, and it should also be non-empty, I guess. I mean, really, I should have a condition for any finite set of objects, this analogous category is connected. And when that finite set is the empty set, I would just be saying my category is non-empty. So I, I probably have to throw that in um, if I only talk about two objects. Um, so it's a weakening of the notion of filtered co-limit. Um, and uh, these sifted co-limits, the significance of them uh, is that uh, in sets, uh, finite products uh, commute with sifted co-limits. Um, so you may know the fact about filtered columns that all finite limits commute with filtered columns. Um, but if you only care about finite products and not general, say, fiber products, then it's uh, you get well, it'll commute with more things, and it's exactly these extra, this extra reflexive co-equalizers that you get. So this is kind of, I mean, it's kind of a little bit obscure at first sight. Why? So it's not true that a co-equalizer without the reflexive part commutes with finite products, and it might seem a little bit obscure why this little extra bit of data guarantees you this property. Um, but I don't know, There's, uh, if, you've, if you've studied algebraic topology, then you may know this fact that the geometric realization of simplicial sets commutes with products. And it's very closely related to that. So this is actually, a, I think the right way to look at this reflexive co-equalizer category, it's, the, it's some truncation of the simplex category. It's the category of uh, non-empty finite ordered sets uh, with one or two elements. Um, and you can kind of, I don't know, there's a, think about how when you take the product of two simplicial intervals, you get a simplicial square. Um, that's kind of, you, you know, you, you need the non-degenerate simplices to, in order to pop out and form the, uh, that you need the degenerate simplices on your interval to pop out and form the non-degenerate simplices of higher dimension, you know, must exist when you take their Cartesian product. I don't know, there's, there's, uh, there's some, there's something funny going on here. Well, it's not funny. There's something fundamental going on that's not obvious at a naive glance. But so I thought I'd um, right. So let me continue the definition. Um, so we say uh, C is generated by compact projectives. Um, if the smallest co-complete subcategory containing all the compact projectives uh, is C. So if you start with the compact projectives and take, uh, take co-limits and you're allowed to iterate if you like, um, then uh, and you, if you reach C, any object of C by that procedure, then we say that C is generated by compact projectives. But you don't need to iterate, you, you can just take co-limits once. And in fact, you can add, co, co, it suffices to only add co-limits of a very controlled fashion. So the first um, sort of proposition about this um, is that, well, if C is generated by compact projectives, um, then every X in C is directly a sifted co-limit of compact projective objects. And in fact, you can say something more precise. So C is equal to, identifies with a certain categorical construction called the, I don't know, sifted in construction on the full subcategory of compact projective objects. Where this is some, you know, so this is some ca category obtained by a uh, formally uh, add in sifted colimits. Just like if you're used to the in category where you formally add in filtered colimits. So an object in here can always be represented by some, you know, sifted colimit of, oh, whoops, <laughs> sifted colimit of XIs. And if you want to know how to hum from this to, uh, to that, well, you, you can pull out the first co-limit, that's no surprise. Um, so then you get XI 
uh, co-limit j, y, j. But you can also pull out the second co-limit because these are supposed to behave like compact projective objects. So you get um, you know, co-limit over j, limit over i, um, x, i, y, j. And that explains how calculations in this category are formally reduced to calculations among the compact projective objects. So there's an analogy between generated by compact projectives and generated by compact objects and between sifted co-limits and filtered co-limits and this s end construction and the usual end construction. Um, okay, now let me tell you what the basic class of examples is. Uh, So, so, well, any algebraic theory. And so, well, it's, so, if, I mean, if, if you have anything where you have like an underlying set and then you're supposed to specify certain operations on that set from X to the N to X, and those maybe satisfy certain axioms for like associativity or commutativity, or I don't know. Um, if you, uh, yeah. So anything where you kind of, an, you have an underlying set and some operations specified like this with some relations also specified purely in terms of Cartesian products. Um, uh, then, then the category of things satisfying those, uh, that algebraic property forms a category generated by compact projectives. So let me give example here. So, well, let's say abelian groups so here you give a set and you give a map from X squared to X and it satisfies some certain axioms that you can write down, um, associativity and so on. Um, and essentially because everything is expressed on the level of finite products here and uh, this uh, sifted co-limits are the things that commute with finite products. Um, you get that the abelian, uh, abelian groups is generated by compact projective objects. And what are these compact projective objects gonna be? Um, uh, uh, well, they're going to be the, well, a priori, the retracts um, of uh, free abelian groups of finite rank. So uh, Z to the ends. So about this, this business of retracts, I mean, so, I, so the, this S end construction, it applies to say any category with a finite coproducts. So, or maybe I should make a remark that, you know, these compact projective objects is always closed under uh, finite coproducts uh, and retracts. Um, and the retracts are not so important in essence, because if you, the, this S end construction doesn't, I mean, it, it, it does the same thing for, for CCP for, you know, for a, ca a category closed under finite coproducts and its idempotent completion. So if you close under retract, it doesn't change this construction. So if you wanna know what your category is, it's enough to know that it's generated by a class of compact projectives, which is closed under a finite co-limit. So you don't have to know that you have all the compact projectives there. You, all of them would be gotten by taking retracts, but it's often, often you don't have to understand explicitly what the retracts are. Um, right. Um, so another example would be say commutative rings. Uh, so they're the compact projectives uh, are uh, well, retracts again of the polynomial rings. So the, the free object, you always do the free objects on finitely many generators in whatever algebraic context you're working in. So here it's free building groups of finite rank. There it's polynomial rings, you know, non-commutative rings, you'd have the free free algebra on n generators over the integers. Um, another example, you can mix the two, of course, and you can take the category of R modules, and then the compact projectives would be the finitely generated projective R modules. Um, so, but these examples, algebraic theory, algebraic theories have this specific property that the, uh, it's generated by, well, it's in fact, generated by a single compact projective. So, for, so in this case, it's Z, if it was the free object on one generator. Here would be Z bracket X. Here it would be R as an R module. 
then you just take all finite co-products of those to get a sufficient class of compact projectives. Um, but the example that we're going to talk about condensed sets is some, somehow of a, yeah, a different form uh, than this. Um, so it'll be generated not by a single compact projective, but by a whole class of compact projectives. And this means when you're generated by a single compact projective, it makes sense to say that you have an underlying set that tells you a lot about your object, right? But in examples where it's not generated by a single compact projective, well, it's not, you don't just have an underlying set, or you have an underlying set, but it doesn't tell you uh, all that you need to know. Um, okay, so now uh, let's talk about again this intersection, so of topos um, and S in. So how can uh, S in, so how can we characterize which topoi um, are generated by compact projectives? So again, there's a little proposition. Um, so in a topos, what is this concept of compact projective? Um, Um, so it's compact projective if and only if, well, well, it's quasi-compact and projective. Um, again, so you always have to be careful there, are, you know, these two different notions of compactness in a topos being a compact object and being quasi-compact. So every cover has a finite subcover basically. Do, do not agree in general, but uh, when you add the projectivity condition, they become the same. So, and it's the same as saying if X is covered by um, a collection of maps, you know, FI. Um, so if you have a epimorphism from some disjoint union of X i's to F, uh, then there exists a finite subset, uh, J subset I, uh, and a splitting of, disjoint union i and j, x i, uh, going to x. Um, so it is kind of a mixture of what you would think of as being quasi-compact, so every cover has a finite subcover, and what you would naively think of as being projective, so every surjection has a splitting, in essence. Um, so that's one thing you can kind of make very explicit what um, the compact projectives are. Um, and um, another thing is, uh, so, um, so we'd like to understand what the topos is generated by compact projectives are. And in general, if you have a generating set for a topos, then you can describe your topos as she's with respect to the induced Grotendieck topology on that subcategory. So you might wonder what kind of Grotendieck topologies arise on the collection of compact projectives in the case where compact projectives generate the topos. So um, uh, suppose um, C is a category uh, with, uh, with finite coproducts. Um, so, uh, We'd like to know, um, so the, 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 the compact projective objects in a topos are basically the ones for which, so you know that when you have a splitting, then the question of uh, the sheaf condition being satisfied over X um, for this covering here is equivalent to the same question for this disjoint union. So in other words, every covering is in some sense refined by a finite disjoint union covering. So if we wanna get our topos is generated by compact projectives, we should start with a category with finite coproducts and just try to make the Grotendieck topology, which says that you know finite coproducts should be covers. Um, so when is that a Grotendieck topology? Um, well, we need to make sure that the, in some sense, the axioms of a topos are set. The, one, the axioms of topos are satisfied, or the, the ones that we have access to by virtue of the fact that C has finite coproducts. Um, so uh, suppose uh, that finite coproducts are disjoint and universal. So what does this mean? This means that here, this means that if you take X fiber product over X disjoint union Y uh, with Y, then you get the empty set or the initial object. And universal means that if you have um, X disjoint union Y and you have to say X mapping in, um, oh no, so if you, have, if you have X disjoint union Y isomorphic to Z and then you have some Z prime mapping to Z, 
then when you pull back x prime and y prime, you get also a disjoint union decomposition of z. So the pullbacks of finite coproducts are still finite coproducts. Um, then you get a Grotendieck topology. Uh, where the covering sieves are uh, uh, those generated by a finite disjoint union comp uh, uh, decomposition, uh, and this is a this gives a topos uh, generated by compact projectors. Um, and also all topoi generated by compact projectives are of this form uh, with, with C is the, you know, the uh, compact projective objects in, in the topos that you're um, considering. So it's just, I mean, it's kind of something, you know, fairly obvious here, I guess, from topos perspective, you just, you know, if you're an S in category, then all co-limits except for the finite co-products are sort of formally built. So you just start with the category of finite co-products, add the versions of the um, topos axiom that you can articulate with finite co-products. Um, and then that's, yeah, then that'll generate the a topos of the required form. Um, okay, well, so this is a whole bunch of abstract nonsense. Um, let's get to the example that we care about. Uh, but maybe, well, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe I should make a philosophical point here. I mean, so, uh, you know, this top concept of topos uh, is a generalization of the concept of topological space. This concept of S-end category is a generalization of the concept of algebraic theory. Um, and uh, this business of condensed sets was designed in order to be able to mix algebra with topology. And it wasn't by thinking about this that we came to it, but somehow it fits, I don't know. Um, they want a topos living in the intersection here. I mean, it was very concrete calculations that led me personally to, to go with this precise notion. So I wasn't thinking about these abstract concepts, but still it, it makes sense from a purely abstract perspective. So what is the definition? So, um, um, Uh, it's a sheaf on the site of uh, profinite sets um, so these are if you like uh, uh, topological spaces homeomorphic to a, a inverse uh, filtered inverse limit of finite discrete sets um, this category is also equivalent to the pro category of finite sets. So the name really does fit. Um, uh, with the topology uh, generated uh, by finite disjoint unions uh, and surjective maps. Um, uh, there is a, uh, there is a little, um, set theoretic subtlety that one perhaps ought to mention. Um, this category of profinite sets is not a small category. So um, the notion of a sheaf on a large category is not exactly well-defined as a category, the category of sheaves at least. So um, one should fix maybe a cutoff cardinal kappa, which should be a strong limit cardinal. And then you'll see why it should be a strong limit cardinal in just a second. Um, but, and then just consider only the profinite sets bounded by kappa. This is a purely a technicality and it's not very important, but I feel like I should mention it. Um, and I should also mention that the same concept has been uh, developed uh, by, uh, by Barwick and Hain. Uh, and so they had also started studying this around the same time as us. Uh, they chose a different name called Picnotic Set, and they chose a slightly different way of resolving the set theoretic technicalities, but it's really the same thing. Um, okay. Um, so, well, so what? So, if you're a condensed set, um, then if you're a condensed set X, then by definition you have a value X of T, 
for any T uh, uh, and profinite sets. Um, and you want to think of this as, as a continuous maps from uh, T to X. So you, you think you're, uh, so the idea behind condensed sets is, a, is it's a replacement for topological spaces. And the way that it works is that you, you're sort of only specifying the topology by specifying what the continuous maps are from a profinite set. So, or the other way of thinking about it um, in terms of, you know, the fact that in a topos, every object is generated under colimits by objects in the image of the Oneida embedding um, is that you're only looking at topological spaces, which are somehow built from profinite sets. And, um, well, and it's not really equivalent to topological spaces, but it's some, something that's formally built from profinite sets subject only to the relations that are sort of implicit in the definition of the site here. So everything you're supposed to, when you do condensed sets, you're supposed to think that everything is built out of profinite sets. Um, and you're not supposed to care so much about open subsets anymore, um, but just the manner in which you build things from these basic pieces. Uh, okay. Um, so, the idea should be that um, this is a very nice topos. Uh, so it ver behaves very much like sets, a lot like sets, uh, like the topos of sets, um, and mixes with algebra well. Um, but on the other hand, um, it contains Lot, uh, the, lots of topological spaces of interest, or basically all, all topological, uh, that's maybe an exaggeration. Things most topological spaces people study uh, as a full subcategory. And moreover, it, it, it doesn't do weird things to them <laughs> and calculations with them, for example, uh, work out nicely. And I'm going to give one example of that uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, so, um, but maybe I'll say right now what it, uh, make this more precise contains uh, most topological spaces as a full subcategory. So there's a there's a functor from topological spaces to condensed sets, um, which makes kind of this intuitive description of the t-value points into a definition. So uh, it's called x goes to x underline. So x underline of t is just the set of continuous maps from T to X. Um, this gives a fully faithful uh, embedding from um, compactly generated uh, weak Hausdorff spaces. Okay, and maybe you want to put the kappa into there and like kappa compactly generated. No, let me ignore that. Uh, two condensed sets. And um, this is a very large class of topological spaces, which includes, for example, the, the CW complexes people use in algebraic topology. It, conclu it includes any metrizable space. Um, it includes any locally compact space. Um, and so really it's a, for a very large class of things, you can just put them in this world, which again, since it's a nice topos, uh, has very good general features. Um, but on the other hand, yeah, it contains all of the, the reasonable examples that you'd be, you'd be looking at. Um, okay. So, so it is supposed to be some general uh, thing. If you're ever thinking of mixing topology with some algebraic structure, uh, it's a good idea to, we think, use condensed sets instead of using topological spaces. Um, and so Peter is going to go into a, um, a specific example of this in, uh, in terms of real functional analysis. So that's one place where you mix topology and algebra. Of course, to tame infinite dimensional vector spaces, the standard approach is to put a topology on it. Um, and, but Peter's going to explain, well, that perhaps uh, it's more appropriate to tame them by condensed structures instead. Um, uh, but also, 
But I want to say that the main thing we do with this is the so. Um, um, so what do we do with these? What do we do with condensed sets? Well, the main thing is it lets us make a, a definition. Uh, uh, notion of an analytic ring. So, and what is an analytic ring? So an analytic ring is a pair consisting of um, a condensed ring R, um, or maybe I should write R, I never know exactly what notation I should use. Um, well, I'll, just, I'll call the analytic ring R as well without <laughs> with maybe some kind of uh, potential for confusion. Um, or no, I'll call, it, I'll call it script, I'll call the analytic ring script R is, is normal R and then something you call mod R which is supposed to be a full subcategory of just modules over this condensed ring. So condensed abelian groups with an action by this condensed ring R. Um, and this is supposed to satisfy uh, some strong axioms. Um, and you're supposed to think of this as a, uh, uh, of complete objects. So, you know, when you're doing a functional analysis or uh, analytic geometry or any time you're dealing with, uh, you know, modules over a topological ring, um, especially if they're infinite dimensional modules and you kind of want these big things in there to make a good theory, um, then you, <coughs> you run into this problem that the, the notion of tensor product you want to have is a, a completed tensor product. But there's nothing a priori in the definition of the notion of an R module over a topological or condensed ring R that tells you what the completion functor should be. Um, so you actually have to add it in some sense as part of the data defining the theory that you specify not just a ring. So a basic objects in analytic geometry as opposed to algebraic geometry is not just a ring, but a ring together with a notion of completion, which you could say defines the notion of module over the analytic ring that you're interested in. It's the complete R modules in some sense, which is part of the definition. Um, and um, so, uh, yeah, so this, uh, and then we can globalize this uh, analytic ring in the style of algebraic geometry. You can globalize analytic rings to analytic spaces. And you get a theory which encompasses uh, all sorts of classical notions of analytic or algebraic space. So schemes give examples, uh, complex analytic spaces, Uh, rigid analytic spaces. Well, I don't know. Uh, yeah, you can even do things like topological manifolds or real manifolds. Uh, sorry, not maybe not topological manifolds, not so obviously. Real manifolds, at least. Smooth manifolds, I mean. Um, no, even the topological ones are okay. <clears throat> That's not obvious to me, but uh, I'll trust you on that. <laughs> I mean, it's not nuclear, yeah. At least, at least I have, it gives me pause, yeah. The idea of... Yeah, no, but yeah, anyway, it works. Okay. Um, the Overconvergent continuous functions, they behave as they should. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, all right, yeah, fine. And someone uh, follows automatically from them somewhere being a module over, over exigent, whatever, smooth functions. They have but, to behave correctly, anyway. But there's, you just have to check some. It follows. What? It follows automatically. It does. Okay. Well, I certainly trust you on that. Um, I did, yeah. All right. So, um, yeah. Um, okay. So now, uh, oh, um, so there's something about this situation that I want to point out. Um, so, well, essentially because of the fact that, ah, so, well, I, actually, I haven't yet explained why condensed sets is generated by compact projectives. So why is condensed sets generated by compact projectives? 
Well, certainly this defining site of profinite sets does not consist in general of compact projectives. I mean, we need both. We have the topology generated by finite disjoint unions and surjective maps, and these surjective maps really are playing an important role here. Um, you can't just leave them out. Um, but so nonetheless, there is a subcategory which still generates the topos. Um, and this comes from a remark of Gleason's, I guess. Uh, so the category of profinite sets has enough com compact objects. Uh, so for all profinite sets T, we're actually, it's enough, I mean, it's enough to talk about a compact Hausdorff space T. Um, there exists a, a T prime, a profinite set, uh, with a surjective map, uh, T prime maps to T, uh, such that, uh, you know, any surjection uh, to T prime splits. So you can cover any object by a, um, a projective object. And since the topology is, is finitary, then that will mean it will be a compact projective object. Um, okay, uh, so uh, that's actually quite easy to see why this, well, once you have a certain construction, it's fairly easy. So in fact, you can take uh, T prime to be the stone check compactification of the underlying discrete set, the underlying set of, um, of T. So certainly the discrete set underlying T is, it has a continuous map to T and by the universe, uh, surjective map, and by the universal property of stone check compactification that extends to this thing here. And on the other hand, every surjection here splits because it suffices to split the, by the, again, the universal property, it suffices to split the restriction to T discrete but by the axiom of choice, any surjection to a discrete set admits a splitting. Um, so, um, so that's that. Um, so there is a, a different defining site, which consists of the projective uh, profinite sets, or you could just also just take the profinite sets of this form, stone check compactification of a discrete set, um, which defines this. Um, okay. Now I want to point something out here that this uh, this automatically implies that you know uh, that when R if, if ever R is a condensed string then mod R is an abelian category well that's that's general topos theory uh, but it's an abelian category which also is generated by compact projectives um, and this implies that. It has the exact same, has the, all the exactness properties, has the same exactness properties uh, as, uh, you know, the category of abelian groups or the category of modules over an ordinary ring. Because if you have a compact projective object in an abelian category, um, then Homs out uh, from your, your abelian category A to abelian groups, it commutes with all co-limits and all limits. Well, all limits is obvious. All co-limits, well, it commutes with all sifted co-limits because this is compact. But then the only thing difference between a sifted co-limit and an arbitrary co-limit is a finite co-product. But in an additive category, finite co-products and finite products are the same. So that, that's automatic as well. Um, so this means, that, and now if you have compact projective generators, then you can test everything on maps from compact projective objects. And that means that any question of commuting a limit with a co-limit or a limit with another limit or whatever, everything reduces to abelian groups. Um, so for example, okay, filtered co-limits are exact. Um, again, this is a general feature of a topos, but something that's definitely not a general feature of a topos, filtered inverse limits are also exact. Um, and that's, very, that's actually quite crucial for some of the calculations that we do. Um, and yeah, it's a nice, property, so, or filtered, or infinite products are exact. Um, right. Um, so, um, yeah, I meant, I meant just infinite products are exact, not filtered inverse limits, I apologize. Um, so, um, right, and then the axiomatics that I didn't spell out, but they also imply that uh, modules over a script R is also, uh, category generated by compact projectives. 
And this means that although it is encoding some kind of functional analysis or something, where you have some more or less topological ring and some notion of complete modules over, over with some complete tensor product, from a purely categorical algebraic perspective, these things are not that much different from working with modules over an ordinary ring. The only difference is that instead of having one generator, you have a whole family of generators parameterized by your profinite sets, say. Um, so, but from a formal perspective, this lets you import many notions from pure algebra into this uh, setting, but then it, has it gives you implications in analytic geometry or in functional analysis. Um, um, just through this, this route here. And there, and there it is really important that we, not just that we live in the world of topos, although of course that gives you a lot, but that you also live in this world here. This, these, um, these compact projectors are very important for us. Um, now, but you also might think, okay, well maybe now that you have, uh, how important is the topos concept really? So now that you have your nice abelian categories uh, generated by compact projectors, you really need to know that they came from a topos? Well, maybe not, but to produce examples of this axiomatics that we have, it's extremely important that you, you come from a topos. And I want to explain a mechanism. Um, well, I want to explain why essentially. Um, so. Also, it's extremely useful in practice to have it come from a topos because if you want to say how, what it means for like a, Group to act on such a thing in the yes, logical so, condensed group. Yeah. So and this only really makes sense if there's this ambient topos formalism around. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah. Thank you. So, <clears throat> or, I mean, I would just be repeating what Peter said, but just in case. Um, yeah. If you want to, you know, if you want to know what a, a a representation of a group, you you know, one thing you'd like to do with abelian categories is, for example, look at, I don't know. Uh, well, basically just what Peter said, you might want to talk about G modules for a condensed group G. And to make sense of that, you have to know that it came from a topos basically. Um, and again, well, yeah, I'm gonna make a similar point in just a second at the more primitive levels of condensed sets that um, having viewing condensed sets in here is actually kind of uh, quite crucial. Um, okay. Um, Uh, yes. Um, but first I wanna, I wanna say something again, quite general. So I was talking about topos generated by compact projectives. Um, and it was the same thing as saying topos generated by quasi compact projectives. Uh, but in this example, we have something, um, something even better. Um, these generating quasi compact, uh, quasi compact objects are also quasi compact, quasi separated. So, uh, so if you have a <coughs> topos generated by quasi compact objects, then an object is said to be quasi separated. If whenever you have two quasi compact objects mapping to it, then the fiber product is also quasi compact. And it follows then that if you look at the collection of quasi-compact, quasi-separated objects, um, so if you're generated by quasi-compact, quasi-separated objects, you get very good closure properties. Uh, so it's closed under finite limits. And one of the fundamental examples of a co-limit, namely, uh, and quotients by equivalence relations. Meaning if you have a quasi-compact, quasi-separated object and you push it by a quasi-compact, quasi-separated equivalence relation, you still get a quasi-compact, quasi-separated object. Um, so this QCQS is the most, maybe the most convenient finiteness property um, you can have in a topos. Um, and so it's, it's convenient because it has all these uh, good closure properties which involve the usual operations one considers in topos theory. Well, not the infinitary ones, but you know, if you consider this, this is finitary, then it's got the finitary closure properties that you usually use. Uh, in contrast to the projective objects, which don't have very good closure properties at all, the only thing they're closed under is finite coproducts and, and retracts. Um, so yeah, it follows also that, um, you know, 
the collection of quasi-compact, quasi-separated objects will also give a different defining site for our topos. In our, and in our example of condensed sets, um, quasi-compact, quasi-separated is exactly the same thing as compact house door. So, um, so this purely topos theoretic finiteness property recovers this standard um, kind of finiteness property in point set topology. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and it also tells us that we have another possible defining site for condensed sets. We can make the same definition and replace profinite sets by compact house door spaces and we'd get the same topos. Um, right. Um, uh, now, um, I want to say, so how do we produce examples of these strong axioms? Well, I haven't said what the strong axioms are, but to verify these things, you essentially need to do X calculations. Um, so to produce analytic rings, uh, you need to be able to calculate X. And for this, we use a, uh, we use a, uh, use a, a, a topos theoretic result. So even though it's X, we're interested in calculating in abelian categories, um, we have to reduce ourselves to topos theory to make these calculations. Um, and this is the, a very interesting theorem of uh, Breen de Lean. Uh, um, so well, there exists a functorial resolution of any abelian group. Uh, uh, by uh, terms of the form. So yeah. well, you take a finite direct sum of the free abelian group on some product of copies So you take a finite direct sum over the free abelian group on some number of copies of uh, the, uh, the free abelian group on the underlying set of the n-fold Cartesian product of A with itself, uh, where you know this is less than, uh, where the exponent is also a finite, finite number. Um, so, well, it's easy to get started, right? I mean, uh, you can always surject from Z bracket A, the free abelian group on A to A by just, you know, in the standard way, take a formal uh, A and A here and map it to the actual A. And it's not too hard to see that the, the kernel of this is generated um, by expressions of the form uh, A plus B minus A minus B. So this lets you continue to a second term here. But then after that, it's actually, a, it's actually not so obvious that the relations between relations here can also be written in this finitary form. And that you can continue infinitely is actually a very serious theorem. Um, and um, I want to give a hint of how it's proved, both because I think it's interesting and because it again generates, gener uh, uh, tells you a bit about the power of um, um, uh, a power of this notion of category generated by compact projectives. So, um, um, right, so, well, the category of abelian groups is one of these simplicial in categories. Um, and so the category itself is formally determined under sifted colimits by the free abelian groups. And that tells you, uh, the finite free abelian groups, and that tells you it's enough to, uh, to handle the case uh, uh, where A is a finite free abelian group, provided again, you ensure the resolution is functorial. Then you'll be able to pass to arbitrary uh, abelian groups. And then, so this is the first step. The second step is that you recognize uh, such a functorial uh, brain, that such a functorial resolution, uh, this as a resolution in, um, of the identity functor. Well, not really identity functor, but so let's call this full subcategory of Z to the N's lattices. So, uh, uh, not the identity functor, but the inclusion functor. Um, by compact projective objects 
uh, in this functor category. So additive functors from lattices to abelian groups. So the claim is that this breen de theorem is exactly equivalent to saying that the uh, inclusion functor from lattices to abelian groups admits a resolution by compact projective objects in this abelian category. And this is a very fluid notion of admitting a resolution by compact projective objects. It's known as being pseudo coherent. Um, and it has a lot of permanence properties which lets you make sort of um, de visage style arguments with it. Uh, and that's very convenient. And the third main idea in the proof is quite remarkable, I think. Uh, well, in, so, so at least in one way of presenting the proof um, is that if you, do, uh, if you do the analog uh, over the sphere spectrum, uh, then this is easy, easy and explicit. So what do I mean? I mean that you can make a resolution, well, you can't say well, of the eilenberg maclean spectrum on an abelian group by finite direct sums of copies of the free spectrum on uh, some finite product of copies of the underlying set of your abelian group A. Um, and actually, the, well, this is easy and explicit if you just know that the eilenberg maclean spectrum is constructed by taking an iterated bar construction of your abelian group. And in the iterated bar construction, the only things that appear, it's a simplicial construction and the only terms that appear are finite products of copies of A. And you just iterate that over and over again and you again only get finite products of copies of A. And this turns into exactly the desired statement. Now, and then the fourth main point is, is Sarah's finiteness. Uh, so that the homotopy groups of spheres are finite abelian groups uh, for I bigger than zero. And, this tells you that the, the sphere version is only a little bit, only finite much off from the desired version with abelian groups. And if you combine with the fact that this notion of pseudo coherence is suitably flexible, um, a suitably flexible kind of finiteness property, then you see that in fact, the sphere version for somewhat inexplicit, uh, but not difficult to explain reasons implies the abelian group version. But it's totally non-obvious to me how to, calculate it or whether it's even possible to write an algorithm to calculate like a resolution up to a hundred terms or something like this. I don't know where on the scale of complexity from say homology of Allenberg McLean spaces to homotopy groups of spheres this problem lies. Um, so it's really quite inexplicit. And for that reason, I think it's all the more remarkable that this inexplicit resolution is our main calculational tool. So, uh, how can you use an inexplicit resolution to do calculations? And I want to end the lecture by giving just one example of this. Um, well, I'll state a result, which, um, so, um, which I think is the first theorem, this first real theorem in this study of condensed sets. Um, and it was the thing that, well, from my perspective, I, needed, I knew I needed the theorem to be satisfied, but I didn't know what the correct definition necessarily of condensed sets was. And I ended up studying this one because it was the only one for which the theorem uh, had a proof. So let me state the theorem. Um, so, well, I already said that locally compact house door spaces all give examples of condensed sets. And in particular, locally compact abelian groups is a full subcategory of condensed abelian groups. Um, uh, well, that's not too difficult, um, but then you also want to know that X between them are reasonable. So if you have A and B in there, uh, then the claim is that if you take uh, the X, the X I um, in condensed abelian groups from A underline to B underline, um, you get uh, just the continuous homomorphisms from A to B in degree zero. Well, that's just what I said about the full faithfulness. Um, you get the extensions uh, of A by B uh, when I equals one. So meaning the locally compact abelian groups which sit in a short exact sequence, that sit as the middle term of a short exact sequence with B on the end and A on the other end. And then you get zero for I bigger than one. Um, so this is an example of calculations in condensed abelian groups. So doing what you want or giving something completely reasonable um, so that this abstract nonsense stuff actually matches with something that looks like it makes sense in the real world. Um, so 
you you'd use a well a lot of reductions uh, reduced to uh, two key calculations. One is that um, x i from the real numbers to z say uh, is zero in all degrees. And the second thing is it's kind of, I guess, Poincaré, I know, the Poincaré rule to that, that if uh, that x i from r mod z to r, not, yeah, r mod z to r is zero uh, for all i bigger than zero. Um, and I want to explain um, how to use the Breen Deline resolution to, to prove something like this uh, to finish up the talk. Um, so, Um, so the Breen Deline resolution. Uh, so I said it, it gives you a functorial resolution of any abelian group by free abelian groups on the underlying set. Now, since it's functorial, it automatically passes to any pre sheaf category. Um, but then, and then you can sheafify, and sheafification is exact. So, in fact, the statement, exactly the same statement, holds in any topos. So any abelian group object in a topos admits a resolution by free abelian group objects on the underlying object of a finite product. Um, so we can in particular apply it to this topos of condensed sets. Um, uh, so then this shows you that x to i, uh, r mod z to r is calculated by, by a complex uh, with terms uh, some finite direct sum of uh, continuous maps from some product of copies, uh, again, finite product of copies of R mod Z uh, to R. Um, and it's actually, this is actually a complex of Banach spaces. Uh, so with just the soup norm, but that's actually also just the Banach space that, that if you take the internal home and condensed abelian groups, it is the same as the condensed abelian group associated to the Banach space with soup norm. Um, so, um, right, but we need one more observation. Uh, so the fact that the Breen Deline resolution is functorial um, and it's a projective resolution, so it's unique up to chain homotopy. Um, tells you a certain in interesting scaling property of the Breen Deline resolution. So if you take, for example, the natural number two, um, then on the Breen Deline resolution, uh, you, you, well, you can consider two different versions of the multiplication by two map. Uh, you can have multiplication by two on the level of abelian groups or on the level of coefficients uh, of Breen Deline. Or you can consider like what we call square brackets two which is uh, given induced by functoriality uh, by multiplication by two on A, on the abelian group A. So those will do two different things to this term here. The, the first map multiplication by two just multiplies all your continuous maps by two, just using multiplication in the reals. Whereas this one is induced by multiplication by two on the inside here. Um, and um, well, the fact that the Breen Deline resolution is a projective resolution tells you that these two are, uh, these are canonically and functorially chain homotopic uh, by some chain homotopy, uh, so H. Um, and this also tells you then by just composing, by just iterating these things and composing the chain homotopies. So multiplication by two to the N is a chain homotopic via some HN to, uh, yeah. Multiplication by two to the n on the inside, um, and now you just have you just uh, so here's a then you just have a small lemma here. Um, suppose you have a a complex of Banach spaces uh, with a self map. Uh, Let's call, it, let's call it multiplication by two, because that's what it will be in the example um, uh, of, bounded, uh, of, of norm less than or equal to one, um, which is homotopic uh, to um, multiplication by two. Uh, then the complex is acyclic. 
So the kernel, uh, kernel of D is equal to the image of D. There's no homology. Um, and well, the proof is kind of simple, I guess. So, well, if you have any uh, sort of cycle, so if you have dx equals zero, then you can write, um, uh, well, you can write two to the n x um, equals two to the n x uh, plus uh, d of this n homotopy h n of x. And this tells you that x is equal to one over two to the n, two to the n of x plus d one over two to the n h n of x. Um, and then you just check that by the explicit formula for composing homotopies that this forms a Cauchy sequence. So that you'll be able to control the norms of the terms rather easily. Um, and then you can, so then you can take the limit and then you'll find that, well, when you take the limit here, because this has norm less than or equal to one, and then we're dividing by one over two to the n, this goes to zero. And you'll find that X is equal to D of something, namely the limit of that Cauchy sequence right there. How um, do you know that the image of D is closed? It follows from the proof. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you prove that it's equal to the kernel of D by exactly this argument. So if you knew in, in advance that it was closed, you would reduce to a much simpler fact that if you have a Banach space on which multiplication by two has, has norm less than or equal to one, then the Banach space is zero. Um, but uh, by the way, that's a, that gives an argument in degree zero that comes from R mod Z to R has to be zero. And that's this is kind of a higher homotopy generalization of that. But yeah, the proof works perfectly fine without assuming anything about the image being closed. Um, okay, so that was just a little uh, a little tour of some uh, some general category theory nonsense related to condensed sets. Uh, thank you very much, all for for listening. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dustin.